Well, um, today um, I chose a passage that, as I was just reading over the last couple weeks, stuck out to me. And it's from Luke 19, so if you have your Bibles, or if you have your Bible app and you want to follow along, we'll be in Luke 19. And uh, it starts in, in verse 1. We're going to start right there. And it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So Jesus is on his way somewhere, going on a journey, on a trip, and he's passing through Jericho. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was very wealthy. So, how many here really love paying taxes? Anyone? No? No? Not even one? Okay, yeah, most people don't. I don't think it would be normal if you really enjoyed giving up your hard-earned money, but that's just something we have to do, right? So anyway, here... We have Zacchaeus. He is the tax man. He collects people's money and gives it to Rome. Now you've got to remember, this is Israel. So they've been conquered by Rome. And so here we have a Jewish person collecting taxes and giving it to a foreign government. Okay? So not only is he taking their money, he's giving it away to a foreign government who has conquered them. So, needless to say, Zacchaeus is probably pretty despised. That, to put it mildly, not only is he despised because he takes money, uh, but because he's viewed as a traitor. He's in collusion with Rome. Not only that, but almost always tax collectors had this reputation for being dishonest. Okay, so the Roman government says, exact this much money from the people, and they say, okay, we'll uh, take this much money so we can put a little bit in our pockets, and it was just a little bit of dishonesty. They wanted to make a little bit more for themselves. Okay? So, people didn't like them. Now, in the Bible and in other ancient literature that talked about these tax collectors, they were often linked with other people. So, it would be like tax collectors and sinners, or tax collectors and, and prostitutes, or, be, or brothel keepers, or, or robbers. Okay? So, this is kind of how they're viewed in, on this, this plane. But not only that, but tax collectors in the Jewish society were considered unclean. Now, there's this, uh, this distinction between clean and unclean. And then when you were unclean, you weren't allowed to be a part of the society. You weren't allowed to take place in the rituals and in the celebrations. You weren't allowed to go to the synagogues. Uh, people who were unclean, um, their houses were unclean. You couldn't necessarily enter into a house, someone who was clean. So they were kind of ostracized. They were outside of the community. And so this is where we find Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, it says in verse 2, was a chief tax collector. Not just a tax collector, a chief tax collector. And so from what I've read to understand about this is a chief tax collector was like at the top of the pyramid. And they had all these cronies under him who had maybe cronies under them. And then each of them had to, to give their money up the ladder. And so here Zacchaeus is at the top. And he's getting all this money, not only from the taxes he's collecting, but from the taxes that all of his people under him are collecting and this kind of going up the ladder to him. So he's very wealthy, but he's also very despised. And so here, it's this. It says in verse 1, it starts with, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So in verse 3, it says, He, meaning Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to know who Jesus was. But because he was so short, he could not see over the crowd. Can anyone relate there? Anyone? No? Okay. Um, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree since Jesus was coming that way. Anyone here ever met someone or seen someone who is famous? Yeah? Anyone? Yeah? Cool. Me too. I, it was really cool. The summer after I graduated from college, I was working in Iowa uh, construction job, uh, just paying the bills, and um, it was really cool. In Iowa, they have this really big, long race all the way across the state called Ragbri, and it's popular. People from all over the world, like literally from Europe and everyone, come, and they ride across the state of Iowa, and I don't know why, but they do it. It's really popular. It's really big, and so anyway, this year that I was working there, it was like the rumor and what the word was spreading that Lance Armstrong was going to be riding through. He was going to be riding in the race. And um, I don't know if you know Lance Armstrong. 
Okay? He's like seven times. He won the, the Tour de France seven times in a row. And this was when I graduated college was back a ways ago, uh, ten years ago, actually. Can you believe that? Wow, I'm old. So ten years ago. This was before Lance Armstrong admitted to taking the PEDs, and like he was considered like the god of cycling. Like He was it, and he was coming through our town. Not only was he coming through our town, but he was going to stop in our town. We had this cafe in the town that I was working in, in Sully, Iowa. It's a little cafe, but they're famous for their pies. And so Lance Armstrong was going to ride his bike on this race. He was going to stop in our town. He was going to get off his bike, go into this cafe, and eat a piece of pie. Can you believe this? The, the cycling god is going to stop in our town and eat a piece of pie. And this was so cool. We were excited. My boss was excited. And so we decided that day we were going to pack up early. And we were working out in the country building this shed or something, I think. And we were going to pack up early and we were going to come into town so we could see Lance Armstrong. And it was so cool. We got there. The place outside the cafe was packed. You know, like they had security, like make sure people didn't get too close and things. And so like I'm in the back, and luckily I'm not vertically challenged. And so I like was standing on my tiptoes. I could see over everybody. And sure enough, up drives with his posse, Lance Armstrong. Okay, he didn't ride alone, obviously. He had to have a posse. And so he rides up, parks in front of the cafe, gets off of his bike, and he walks in. I'm assuming he ate a piece of pie. I wasn't there. And he walks out a few minutes later, gets back on his bike, and rides off. And this was so cool. One of the things that I noticed that I was a little shocked by was he's kind of short. Like, I expected him to be maybe a little taller. I don't know. But anyway, he's kind of short. But I got to see him. It was so cool. And so here we have in the story, Zacchaeus sees or hears that Jesus is coming through. Jesus was the one who has been doing all these miraculous signs, uh, kicking, uh, exercising demons, he's healing people, he's doing these miraculous things, you know, like water to wine and, and food and all, producing all this food. And he's, he's just really popular. And so Zacchaeus says, I want to see him, I want to check this out. So he climbs up this tree. He couldn't see. Unlike me, he was vertically challenged. So he's like, he can't see. The people are maybe like the basketball team standing in front of you when, when you're trying to read the words and you can't see. You're like moving your head around trying to. Uh, but he, he couldn't see. So he's like, I got this idea. I'm going to climb up this tree. So he climbs up this tree and he waits. And here he comes. He, Jesus is coming down. He's like, I got a perfect spot. I'll be able to see him. Okay. So then verse five, Jesus reached the spot. And he looked up to Zacchaeus, and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down and at once welcomed him gladly. Let me just remind us, let's back up a minute. Who was Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was the outcast. Zacchaeus was the one ostracized by society. He was the one looked down upon. He was the one who was despised and rejected. And here, we see Jesus stop and tell him that he's going to spend the day with him. To go to his house, which would have been considered unclean. He is going to spend the day with Zacchaeus. Here we see Jesus' mission and purpose on earth very clearly. He came to seek out the lost, the despised. He came to seek out the ostracized, the unloved, and to show them the amazing love and acceptance and forgiveness of God. And so this is an amazing thing. Like Zacchaeus is pumped. Um, Jesus is like, yeah, I get to spend time with you. He's pumped. And, and, but then all these people around him start to mutter like, what is Jesus doing? Like he's hanging out with him? In verse 7 it says, and the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner? Like people are looking down like, why is he going with Jesus? Like, Did you not see me? Like, I was standing right here. But no, he picks Zacchaeus. And the people are upset. Oftentimes, pious people separate themselves from the sinners. Sometimes it's a healthy desire to to avoid, to not fall into temptation, to, to not succumb to sin. Those are good things. But sometimes... Uh, when, we, when we separate ourselves from 
the outsiders, the despised, the rejected, the ostracized. When we separate ourselves, uh, people can begin to feel superior. They can f- inherently better. And that's what was happening here. The people were saying, well, I'm better than him. Why is he going to be the guest of, of that sinner? But Zacchaeus didn't mind. He stood up and he said to the Lord in verse 8, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of all of my possessions to the poor. Zacchaeus was a wealthy man, remember this. Top of the food chain for tax collectors. And he said, I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, on top of that, I will, give, I will pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. God reaches out to accept the sinner, Zacchaeus, who discovers that he can turn to God. God wants to have a relationship with him. Zacchaeus may have known things about Jesus. He may have heard things. But it wasn't until he experienced the relationship with Jesus. When Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I want to hang out with you. And they, they did. It was through a relationship that Zacchaeus' life was changed. Whoa, sorry. After recognizing his failures, Zacchaeus confesses. And he also makes right his past mistakes. There was a change in his heart. He no longer just thought about himself. He no longer looked out for his own interest. He looked out for others. He said he gave half of his money, half of his possessions away to the poor looking out for the well-being of others around him, no longer thinking about himself first and foremost. His actions spoke for themselves. And so today, there may be some of you here, maybe you can relate with Zacchaeus. Maybe you feel that you're looked at as an outcast, looked down upon, ostracized, or despised. Others of you, if you're honest with yourselves, might be able to relate more with the pious people who looked down on Jesus for hanging out with sinners. Now, no matter which group you fall into, here's the thing. Transformation is possible. That's what I love about this story. Transformation is possible. This person that was the, 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 the lowest in the eyes of the Jews, that looked down upon the most, was also the one who was transformed. Transformation is possible for all through the power of truly experiencing a relationship with Christ, truly experiencing God's love and acceptance and forgiveness. Just knowing about Jesus isn't enough. Going to church, going to Tabor and sitting through Bible classes, it's not enough. We're only changed through relationship. We're not to stay where we are. Wherever we may fall on this spectrum, we're to come in to be continually transformed, to be more and more, to act like Jesus acted. That is what we're here for. We're to continue on his mission to seek out those who are despised and outcast and rejected and to show them and point them to this amazing love that God has for us. Now, how do we get there? What, what do we do? We can't just sit still and say, God, I want to be transformed, and I'm going to sit here until you transform me. Like, that doesn't work that way. We have to move. We have to be into action. And so, um, I'm not saying this is the end-all, be-all, but if you're interested in something in growing and trying to learn and put this into action, we're going, I'm going to be having, um, starting on Monday, and for the next nine weeks after that, I'm going to be leading a Bible study through the book of Ephesians. Now, it's just not about head knowledge. We're going to be watching a 10 to 15 minute video. We're going to be discussing it. And then there's going to be a challenge to go and put into practice that week. Okay? So, if you're interested in in taking maybe a next step in your faith, or maybe learning and and growing a little more, um, I invite you to come out. Now, you don't have to. I'm not, this is no pressure. If you're already involved in lots of other activities, that's fine. But I want to invite you. I want you if you don't have anything else and you want to be a part of this, to come and to engage and to grow and to be transformed, hopefully, through this. And so uh, I'm going to invite you to watch this quick video. This is what we're going to be studying through the book of Ephesians. And then after that, I'll close this in prayer. So 
If, any of that, if anything in that video speaks to you and you think, you know what, I'm interested. Whether you feel like you're a Zacchaeus or you feel like you're one of these pious people that we read about or somewhere in between. Maybe you're not either one, but you're somewhere in between. And you just feel like, I want to do something. I want to be transformed. I want to grow. I encourage you, find a way. Whether it's this or somewhere else, um, find a way to grow. Do something. Don't just sit and wait. Um, this, like I said, this will be going on Mondays. Starting this upcoming Monday, you'll be seeing signs around campus. I encourage you and I invite you, if you're interested, to come on out. That's all I have for you today. Let me pray for you and then you're free to go.